Again? Again? There. An excellent problem solver stands out from others. Some were born different, but some needs constant practice to achieve that level. Regardless of that, this video will show you some of the techniques on how I approach and solve a problem. This is not only applicable to OSCP, but for any other situation that involves finding solutions. In this video, we will find out why. On one of our videos, we cannot query the domain users even we are authenticated to the domain. Last time when doing the post-exploitation on Castle Black, we encountered this odd issue where we cannot see the domain users, which is typically accessible by anyone authenticated to the domain. To replicate again the issue, let's log into Castle Black using our reverse shell exploit script. Getting the domain users inside this shell didn't give us access denied issue, but instead gave us an RPC unavailable message. Now let's try same command inside an RDP session. I'll again use xfree RDP for quick access. Let's open up PowerShell. I'll double check my permissions. Yep, my session have full admin privileges. Then fire up the command. Error is still there, which what we expected. Let's try now same command inside a WinRM session. Same thing, I will log in as administrator. Let's check our permissions. Looks similar to our permissions in the RDP session. And let's check the domain users. Now this gets interesting. We were not able to query the domain users inside our reverse shell and RDP sessions, but we were able to do it inside a WinRM session. Now let's investigate. Since we are dealing with permission issues, it is best to research a bit about Windows authentication model. Although this may not give us direct answers on our question, it will give us a fundamental understanding on how Windows handles sessions, tokens, and so much more. First question is what the heck is this LSA? There is a hyperlink, so let's follow it and open on a new window. This glossary should give us a concise explanation. Let's scroll down a bit. It says it is a protected subsystem that authenticates users to local system. It maintains information about all aspects of local system security. Since it is protected, we can infer that it is something only accessible to high-privileged accounts. It also mentioned all aspects of local security, which means this should include passwords, tokens, and any other kind of local permissions on the system. One last important thing to note is that, since it handles user logins, if by any means it got broken or inaccessible, expect that users won't be able to log in as well. Okay, we had enough about LSA. Let's move on. Let's see what else we can find here. Log on session seems interesting. Let's take a look. It says this is created from the moment the user logs on until he logs off. Self-explanatory. So whenever the session is created, it creates a token for that session. Remember token impersonation attacks? These are those tokens that are being stolen by attackers. Let's open the token glossary in another tab. Where is token? Okay, here we go. See access token. So let's go there. Let's see what's interesting here. Tokens contain security information for a logon session. Does it include all types of security credentials? No idea, but I guess it does. So that's the reason why this is one of the things attackers want to hijack. It also says here that copy of tokens can be found on the process is executed on behalf of the user. I wonder now if our RDP or reverse shell session didn't get all the necessary tokens to perform remote lookup to the domain controller. Still too many questions at this point, but we'll get there. Asking questions is one of the effective ways in understanding things and uncovering mysteries. Going back, let's find more interesting things on the left sidebar. Interactive and non-interactive authentication. Let's take a peek. Interactive happens when a user is prompted for credentials. So, it looks like this pertains to things such as RDP logins. We see here that the central system that handles all this is LSA, which we learned in the previous section. There's also this thing called Gina, which I have no idea at all. Let's scroll down a bit further. It says that the login must start with this sequence, which is most of us knows already. We do this even on RDP sessions, right? I think so. Ah, so Gina is the display part of the authentication process. I see now. Probably worth noting at the last part is that the credentials for interactive authentication is saved somewhere. Does this ring a bell again? All right, I think we have enough about interactive authentication. Let's go to non-interactive. This says that an interactive authentication is required before using this, and it uses the previously established credentials. So I suppose we are still talking about the cache credentials. 
It also seems that this is typically used on remote network connections. Most likely a good example of this is when accessing a Samba share. Now the question is, is our reverse shell an interactive or non-interactive session? Let's move further. The diagram is similar to interactive authentication, but in this case it uses SSP instead of GINA, which makes sense since there is no graphical display involved, this must be handled differently by another subsystem. Now that we have some basic understanding how Windows authentication works, let's explore our current settings. To recap, we can query the domain users within our WinRM, but not on reverse and RDP sessions. What I normally do when debugging issues is to compare a working to a non-working setup. So let's go ahead and compare our group information. I'm gonna put my terminal and RDP window side by side. Actually, I'll just copy the group membership into a file and do a diff to make it clear. I'll get the groups from WinRM first, then get the one from RDP. Let's maximize the terminal pane and do a diff, nice and clear. So our WinRM session includes the network group, which I don't know the exact purpose of it at this point. Let's quickly check our reverse shell session and see if that group is available or not. I don't see it here. So that means we need to be in that group to query domain users? I'm still not convinced, so let's research something about that mysterious group. Let's go back to our RDP session and see if we can find something. I'll first check the local groups. There is a small list. Let's quickly check one by one. Nothing here. I cannot see it here as well. Let's search for it. Nothing. Let's search the net for this group. The results are pertaining to network service, but we are looking for network. Not sure if they are the same. Let's try to exclude network service from the results. I'll check this one from a random form. We might get something useful. At this point, we don't care about the problem being discussed in this form. We just want to check if we can get some information about that network group. This guy says that the NT Authority Network is a new account. If it's an account, then why did we saw it under our group membership? And does it also mean that we can only see this on newer version of Windows? Let's find out more. How about this one? Same thing, we don't really care about the problem statement on this page. We'll just need some tiny bit of information. Let's search for it. We can see here the SID number of that group. Since I'm not yet sure if that is a user or group, I will just call it group for the meantime. By the way, SID are security identifiers that is assigned to a user, computer account, or even thread or process. Since we now know the SID, let's look it up on some docs. I'm pretty sure Microsoft published that somewhere. Let's take the first result and search again. Not this one. There you go. Okay, so this is really a group. I have no idea why the forum we visited a while ago says that this is a user. Maybe that's for a non-Windows server? This is included on all users signed in via a network connection. Pretty sure our reverse shell connection is not a legitimate logon session as we just hacked our way in, so that's why I didn't include this group. But why our RDP session doesn't include this group even though it's a valid logon session? The last sentence says that access tokens for interactive users doesn't include this network SID. So probably that explains why our RDP session doesn't include it. Probably one last thing we want to try in order to verify our findings is to try other ways of connecting to the target. Again, as I showed on my past videos, we can leverage WADCOMs to see possible attack paths or foothold techniques given the things we already have. In our case, we have a username and password, so I will put a check on them. Then let's try something we haven't tried before, such as WMI. WMI stands for Windows Management Instrumentation, which is for remote management and automation of administrative tasks amongst Windows machines. Do you notice something? We selected WMI, but WinRM was also shown on the list. So does it mean our WMI session will have similar logon environment as WinRM? Which means we will see similar group membership and we will be able to query the domain users? Only one way to find out. Let's fire up this WMI command. I'll replace the credentials and target IP. Oops, command not found. I know this is an impacted tool, so meaning we can use this format to launch it. There you go. Now let's check our group membership. Our educated guess is correct. Now let's query the domain users. And there you go. We were able to query them inside a WMI session, which means WinRM most likely uses WMI under the hood to establish remote connection, meaning tokens and permissions will be similar on both. In summary, remote lookups to Active Directory objects may not work on some sessions. If something didn't work, try a few alternatives first before giving up. When looking for answers and solutions, learn to grasp only the needed information to get you going. Digging deep on a topic may be time-consuming. Learn to prioritize things. 
If you notice when we were looking for answers, we just relied on small amount of information available to us, such as the glossary. Those were enough for us to get more context on the problem. In real life scenario, you need to look up answers quick and train your mind to think fast. If you don't do this quickly enough, you will see yourself in a state where new problems come in, but you are still looking for solution to an existing problem. One last important tip, OSCP is not complicated, but it is overwhelming at first. You are presented with a lot of rabbit holes. It's up to you to decide on where to go. Having a feel on what makes sense and what is worth enumerating is not a skill you can learn in one day. You need consistent practice. I hope you learned a valuable lesson for today. Skills not only intended for OSCP, but for any situation that involves problem solving. If you want to learn more tips on problem solving, watch the exploit development video or any other videos from our Active Directory Attacks playlist. Thank you for joining me until the end of this video. See you on the next one.